thank you very much indeed. It's a real pleasure to be with you all here today. As was just mentioned, I'm an environmental lawyer, and I am the CEO of Client Earth. Now, Client Earth is an unusual group of lawyers in that we set ourselves up as a charity, and we really take the earth and all who dwell upon her, or sometimes we say all who sail upon her, as, as our clients. Now, in addition to that, I'm also a Zen Buddhist priest. And uh, in Zen, we uh, talk about uh, taking care or protecting or saving all sentient beings. And that's, in fact, a vow we take every day. I take that in a very literal way. So for me, the work we do at Client Earth and that vow are the same. So when we as lawyers work to stop climate change, to save the rainforests, to save the fish in the sea, to protect human health, and to give access to justice, it is very much that. So that's the perspective from which I'm coming from uh, to visit with you this afternoon. And what I'd like to do is to share a new ecological theory, reasonably new, that I'm crazy about, then talk about how it might apply to human society, and then talk about the young person's declaration of rights. So uh, the new ecological science that I love so much is called resilience theory. And where it comes from is this. The question was how to look at natural systems and figure out what they needed in order to be stable, healthy, and indeed resilient after they had an insult, uh, whether it's a storm or the result of climate change. This kind of understanding of what natural systems needs becomes obvious as climate change goes on. Well, what happened when scientists uh, looked first at forests was they saw that a certain degree of complexity was needed to guarantee resilience or stability. And the minimum was three levels of scale and of time. So can I have the first slide, please? So the leaf. Now, this was the, the first level of scale they looked at. And in time, as you'll know, with a deciduous tree, the leaf lives generally for a year. Second scale and length of time is the tree. Now, trees can live for 100 years, can live indeed for thousands of years, uh, and obviously also uh, emerge into this larger frame of scale. And finally, the forest. Now, the forest is perhaps several uh, 100 square miles, perhaps several thousand square miles. In time, it may last for hundreds up to tens of thousands of years. In the case, say, of the Amazon rainforest or of the Bielowieża rainforest uh, in Poland, which has been there since the Ice Age. Now, what emerged as they analyzed deeper, uh, the thought had been that trees create the forest. Uh, that trees appear where it's convenient for them ecologically to appear, and then forests happen. And so it's the tree that controls the whole business. It turned out that that's not true. And what they found was that it's the forest that actually controls what lives there. So the forest, acting as a kind of superorganism, controls the chemistry, often controls the rainfall, and other variables. So it's the forest itself which is, if you will, deciding what organisms can live there, what, what can be there. Uh, and the way the scientists captured this idea was with the phrase that it's the long, slow variables that control the quick, fast variables. The long, slow variables are the ones that are important. So the forest controls the tree, controls the leaf. I believe this applies also in human culture. It does, by the way, apply very broadly throughout the natural world. It appears to be one of those uh, rules of great generality. I think it also applies to our human systems. Let's talk about our own stories. What would be comparable to the level of the leaf? I would suggest that it would be the annual cycle of, say, what happens in a parliament or Congress. This is where, as activists, we generally are focused. It's where the news is focused. It's where most human attention is focused, at this rapid cycle, what we may think of in our own human terms as our version of the leaf cycle. The longer cycle, say the generational cycle, might be what uh, gets called an era. So the Thatcher era here, a conservative era, which lasts, uh, it has influence for a generation, ripples beyond a generation. A progressive one in the United States, the New Deal, similarly, uh, a generation uh, and beyond. Then what's at the forest level? So for us, I would suggest that it's the very big, large-scale stories that are at the forest level. And for a long time, they were given by religion. For example, in Europe during the Middle Ages, Christianity was the story. Uh, and what's important to notice about this is just like the forest, it's the story, it's the big story that controls all the smaller variables. 
So in Christianity in the Middle Ages, if you didn't agree, uh, it was a very good idea not to say so, or you might be tortured and killed. So the big story was controlling what we could even speak about. I would say the same is true today to a very large degree. Uh, but we saw the Christian Middle Ages story changed over time with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And I would ask the question, what's our story today? And I think it's quite clear that our story today is uh, neo-capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, the Washington Consensus neoliberal capitalism. Now, it has a number of chief characteristics. Um, one uh, is that globalization is an unexampled and unalloyed good. Another is that the market solves all problems uh, if left alone. It's really up to the market to do everything. The next is that it's the job of governments uh, to get out of the way of markets, because markets are a perfect cure for all our ills. Then that uh, economic growth endlessly is needed if we are to survive, preferably between 2 and 4% a year. And then the story of who we are is also in there. So what's our job? What's our purpose in life? Because our big story gives us our purpose in life. And our current story tells us that uh, our job in life is to be consumers. So we must work hard. We must earn money in order to buy lots of goods, which then can keep driving the economy. Now, uh, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I'm sure you all have many ideas about what's wrong with the picture. Uh, I would suggest that there are two primary ones. The first is that even though it's the story that gives us, or in theory gives us meaning in life, it doesn't connect with most of the things that are actually important to human beings. So there's no place in the story for compassion, for love, for intimacy, for connection with the natural world. They simply don't figure in this most important dominant story which controls everything that governments do, everything that municipalities do, and much of what uh, individuals do. It also, second problem, puts us on a collision course uh, with the natural world. Because the natural world, as you will know, does not increase its productivity of goods and resources between 2 and 4% a year. It simply doesn't do that. So we are now in a period of rapid global warming. We're now in a period where biodiversity is being rapidly destroyed. The great Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson believes that 27,000 species a year are already being exterminated. I would attribute these effects to precisely to our story because, again, it's the story, like the forest, which controls everything that happens within the culture. Now, if we don't like the effects of the story, how do we change it? Uh, well, as activists, mostly we don't look at the story. We actually look at the quick, fast variables. We're working on the leaves. We're working on annual events. We're working on uh, stopping individual coal-fired power plants, getting a bill through parliament. All good things. But this in itself won't control, won't change the big story any more than the leaf can control the forest. So we need to look at that story directly and ask how we change it. I might ask first, who can change it? And for that, uh, looking at all of you, I would say you can, because what is a story, after all? It's a program or a tape that runs in our minds. So if we change our minds, and enough of us change our minds, we actually change the story. Uh, we also need a positive story to replace the current story. And here's where we get to the young person's Bill of Rights. The environmental movement, where I've spent my life, hasn't been very good at coming up with positive alternatives to the current story. We challenge things. We have make negative announcements. Some of them are very important, some of them very helpful. But we haven't come up with a positive rationale, something to replace the story. And unless there is a new story, the old story doesn't go away. It was the Renaissance that replaced uh, medieval Christianity. I've been working with the idea that if we believed, if you believed, and we recognized that young people have a right, a legal right, a real right, an enforceable hard right, to receive the biosphere in good condition, and then the duty to pass it on to further generations, that that would be a very positive, profound place to start the new story. Imagine, if this right were real, what the immediate consequences would be. We would not be able to be investing as we are in hundreds of new coal-fired power stations. It simply wouldn't fit with the model of giving you a biosphere that's in good shape. We would have to stop killing species at the rate of 27,000 a year. It doesn't fit with the right you have to get a biosphere in good shape. So uh, working with this, uh, Jonathan Bailey, my counterpart here, 
suggested that I come up with a document that tries to capture this. And we talked to a number of groups of young people, and this document, uh, a draft, is, is what's uh, emerged. Let me share it with you. The Declaration of Young People's Rights to a Healthy Planet. We, and imagine that I'm not reading it, but that millions of young people are reading it to you now. And I would recommend just listening to it rather than following the text, because you can take that with you. <clears throat> We are the youth of the world. We represent all future generations of human beings. We know that every generation has an equal right to the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, all plants and animals, and the ecosystems in which they live. We know that each generation has the responsibility to use the world's species and ecosystems so as to permit equal use by future generations. We were born into a time when the use of the Earth's resources by the older generation threatens the security of all life. This excessive use plunders our future and that of our children. It threatens our happiness, livelihood, property, the basis of our life, and our liberty. This excessive use of the world's species and ecosystems must end for our sake and the sake of all future generations. We call on our leaders and demand change. We demand that world leaders sign a binding commitment with us directly, a contract with the youth of the world. In this contract, we demand a commitment to meet by 2020 these key targets. To reduce or stop the loss of biodiversity, to stop the extinction of species, to reduce pollution to safe levels, to restore and safeguard ecosystems and the services they provide, to manage and harvest fish and shellfish sustainably, to ensure that waters, uh, terrestrial and marine, are managed sustainably, to conserve and restore nature and living organisms so that they can withstand and help to combat climate change and desertification. We demand that these commitments be met so that we are guaranteed our natural right to enjoy a healthy, living planet. We demand that the contract between the world's governments and ourselves to this effect be enforceable in international law. There is no more time to delay while the fabric of life is torn and scraped away. We demand action now and pledge our time, our energy, and our passion to making it happen. <clears throat> now, imagine a world in which that right were recognized. As I was saying, it would be a world in which governments would have to make different decisions, uh, in which municipalities and individuals would make different decisions, and in which we understood ourselves in a different way. We would have a more open, spacious understanding of who we were and what our life was about. Now, stories change. The main story in any culture evolves and changes. We can evolve our current story. We can do it together. And my suggestion is, if this resonates with you, next slide, that you visit this website. Oh, we're there. Visit this website. Um, this declaration is there. You can sign it. Um, and if millions of people signed this, millions of young people, and took this story of your own right to a healthy biosphere on and made it your story, and then demanded that political leaders accept it as true, then the story that we hold as a culture could change. I think it's an enormously important experiment in changing our story as culture. Um, but it's up to you. I invite you to consider doing this, and if it interests you, to do it. If it does interest you, please share it with your friends. Please spread it widely, and then please demand that our political leaders sign too. So it actually becomes a moral contract. We can change the story of our culture. Uh, if we do and change it in a positive way, we will be able to be in a place to live in the world we want to live in. I think this is something that we can do together. And particularly, I know it is something that you can all do. So thank you. <clears throat>